Good evening, Olive, Arlo, and Frank. Grandpa coming to you from the living room in Jacksonville Beach. And today we're going to jump into chapter 12, the book of Matthew. Once again, we're reading in the new um, English translation, the NET, or NET Bible. Excellent resource excellent translation of the Bible. It, it goes back to all the originating texts that biblical scholars rely on the most. And it <clears throat> has, if you buy the, the scholar's edition, it has something like a thousand footnotes in it. This edition is, is is based on that, and if I had the full screen on here, you would see all the notes over to the right. So when you go online, you can you can get this version, and you can read the notes, and, and actually, in the online Bible, you can click on it. When I read the Bible to you from a physical Bible, and you see me in the picture, I'm reading from the reader's edition, which doesn't have a lot of notes in it has large print. I'm an old guy with bad eyes, so I need some large print. Anyway, chapter 12, verse 1 says, At that time, Jesus went to the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pick heads of wheat and eat them. But when the Pharisees, and we remember that the Pharisees are these guys who have developed this law based on the biblical law but they've added to it and and so they're always going around and telling people well you're not holy you're not righteous we are because we follow these rules that we set up so they come around and they say when they saw this they said to him look your disciples are doing what is against the law to do on the sabbath and they're, and they're actually telling the truth. This is against the biblical law. And their law is based on the biblical law. And, and it's, they're, they're doing work on the Sabbath. That's punishable by death in the Old Testament. You're supposed to just rest. You're not supposed to start a fire. You're not supposed to cook a meal in... in Conservative, um, well, I don't know if all conservatives keep this, but the the uh, Orthodox Jews who, who keep kosher, they, from sundown on Friday evening till sundown on Saturday evening, they do not drive cars, they do not cook, they, they make the food the day before and they eat the food, and, and they have a day of rest, the Sabbath, the Shabbat. So let's see what... Jesus says to them, and he said to them, haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? Now he entered the house of God and ate the sacred bread, and that was the showbread, which was against the law for him or his companions uh, to eat, but only for the priests. And, and this is true. This is what happened. So we're going to see something really, really important to Christianity and the New Testament versus the Old Testament. Or have you not read in the law that the priests in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are not guilty? So they, in, in the, on the Sabbath, the priests do work in the temple. Now at this time, when Jesus is talking, that temple's there. That temple's gonna be raised. It's gonna be destroyed by the, the Romans in the year 70 AD. But at this point in time, this temple's there and there's worship going on. And even though you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath, the priests were there worshiping that day. Cause he, they're saying to Jesus, like, dude, <laughs> These people are working on the Sabbath. Now, are they really working? 
they're walking through a field, so they're going someplace, which didn't necessarily work, unless they're on a work trip. <laughs> they're walking someplace and they're hungry, so they go in and just pick some some of the grains off and they and they eat them just for some substance substance. I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what this means, now he's going to quote the Old Testament, I want mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have, have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now this has to be blowing their minds. It's like, well, there's this law, and God wrote the law. And he's gone, in essence, it's God's law, right? Well, I'm the Lord of God's law. So he's telling them that he's God. I'm God. Very hard to understand people in, in take the faith of Islam uh, and, and all of your, your I, I don't know what your dad's religious beliefs are, but I know what your grandfather's religious beliefs are. And your grandfather, Ibrahim, he's, he's a Muslim. And he believes that Jesus is not God. Jesus says that he is. And that's something that you, you have to figure out on your own. I'm going to try in this whole series of Bible studies to not tell you what to think. I'm going to let you know what I believe. I don't do things to, to teach you what to think. I want to do it to teach you how to think. So people say, well, Jesus never said that he was God. Yeah, well, he does right here. For the Son of Man, he's talking to him about himself. He's the one who's there. These are his guys. And he's going, my guys are doing this because I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath belongs to me. Well, the Sabbath belongs to God. Because in the beginning, when God created the heavens and earth at the beginning of Genesis, he created them in six days, and the seventh day was Shabbat. That's why the Jews celebrate Shabbat, Sabbath. God rested, so they rest. And eventually in the law, God said, it's my law that because I rested, and it says that, six days you work, seventh day you rest. And Jesus is going, that's my law. But you don't understand that. So the next time somebody says, Jesus never said they were God, whether you believe he's God or not, I hope that you do believe that, but that's up to you. You have to deal with that. But here, he's saying that he is. Then Jesus left that place and entered their synagogue. So he's going to the house of worship. <clears throat> when, the, when, when they were taken into captivity um, in, in the Babylon, and there was the beginning of the diaspora, they created synagogues. They created places where they could go and worship. Now there's synagogues back there. When they came back, they brought the tradition of synagogues with them. The word synagogue is a Greek term. It's, it's not a Hebrew term. And, and the Greek was spoken in that part of the world. So they come back and it's like, yeah, okay, now we have these synagogues. And it's called their synagogue. So this area that he's in, he goes to the synagogue, the local synagogue. A man was there who had a withered hand. And they asked Jesus, 
So they're setting them up. Word must have gotten there. Like, homie thinks he's God. He thinks he's the Lord of the Sabbath. Well, let's see what homie says. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they could accuse him. So they're asking him. They're pretty sure he's going to tell them what they want to hear, and then they're going to accuse him. They're going to try to have him killed. And he said to them, Would not any one of you, if he had one of his, his sheep that fell into a pit on the Sabbath, take hold of it and lift it out? And he knows the answer to that. So Jesus does that all the time. He answers a question with a question. When I do that, your grandmother goes, you're answering a question with a question. And then I say, well, I'm trying to be like Jesus. And she goes, you're not doing a very good job of it. You're not like him. But remember, everything that happens in Through the Bible with Grandpa stays in Through the Bible with Grandpa. Do not share that with your grandmother. But wouldn't they, if they had an animal on their farm, fall in there, are they going to let it sit there until after sunset on Saturday? They say that like at 9 o'clock at night they hear this, the horrible cries and they go out and they, they have a, a sheep that fell, fell into a pit and it can't get out by itself. they going to let it sit there to the next evening, like for almost a whole day? No. How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. In a way, what he's saying is, like, oh, you think this is work for me? Oh, you may. This is work for me? I'm doing good. And when you're in the medical field, when you heal people for a living, I would hope, like, all of your, your dad and Arlo, your mom, they're both in the medical field. That's not like, oh, I got to go to work today. That they go, oh, I get to go and help people. You know, I wasn't like that when I was a, a cop. I, I didn't go in there going, yeah, I'm going to get to go out and help people because... I was dealing with the dregs of society. But if you know, some dude has a heart attack and you help that guy to live, he was going to die, but now he's alive because of you. That's a job at a whole nother level. And that was one of the main jobs that Jesus, I mean, he did, he did miracles. He walked around and touched people and, and they were healed. So he says this to these guys, and trust me, they're all looking at him. The whole synagogue is looking like, oh, no, he's not going to, is he? No. What's he going to do? What's he going to do? And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and it was restored. Now think about what's going on. Wouldn't you go, wow, he just healed this guy with a withered hand. We don't know, like by withered, maybe it had been crushed under some giant rock and it was withered that way or, or maybe it was some sort of a congenital disease that he had like, there's this disease that, People have disease, but this affliction that people are born with, where they have like this kind of stumpy little arm, and, and it has a little flipper kind of hand on it. And maybe that's what the guy had. But in front of everybody, he goes like, Droop, zap. And it's restored to a natural, normal functioning hand. And what do people do? 
No, they don't go like, yeah, how do you do that? Can I do that? Where'd you learn that? Did you go to school for that? <laughs> no. In a way, they're going, are you licensed to do that? It was restored as healthy as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted against him as to how they could assassinate him. So they want to kill him. Because, of course, when com somebody comes around and starts healing people, casting out demons, what else are you going to do? Why wouldn't you kill him? Because Jesus threatens their authority. And he knows it. That's why he's doing it in front of them. He knows the end game. He knows that they're going to kill him. But because he knows that they're going to kill him, and he does those things anyway, I know the story. That story's still here. Now, when Jesus learned of this, he went away from there. And, and he didn't go away because he was scared. Trust me. Great crowds followed him, and he healed them all. So it's not saying he healed the whole crowd. He healed everybody who followed him to get healed. He healed them all. So now he's like ramping this game up, like a uh, big, uh, like top notch. Oh yeah, a thousand people come to get healed. Boom, you're healed. Everybody's healed. It's like Oprah. You get a car. You get a car. You know, you get a new arm. You you get your broken leg fixed. You get your leprosy healed. But he sternly warned them not to make him known. So, and he's done this before. He heals people and says, don't tell anybody. <laughs> he knows they're going to tell somebody. If this happened to you, you're going to tell somebody. Trust me. This fulfilled what was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I take great delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He, he will not quarrel or cry out. I believe that proclaim justice to the nations was what was inscribed on the Liberty Bell. Um, which was in Philadelphia, it's still in Philadelphia, but it was big time revolutionary war symbol. He will not quarrel or cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed or extinguish a smoldering wick until he brings justice to victory. And his name, the Gentiles will, and in his name, the Gentiles will hope. At this point in time, Jesus has come to the Jews and the Jews only. In fact, when he sent his guys out, he said, okay, guys, it's what you do. Don't take money. Go out. Heal people. Cast out demons. Spread the good news. If they don't like what you got to say, knock the dust off your feet, curse the town, and leave. But whatever you do, only go to the children of Israel, the children of Jacob. And But now he's given a hint. This is going to be worldwide. The Gentiles, the non-Jews. I'm a Gentile. All of us are Gentiles, 100%. You have relatives that are Jewish. They're kind of relatives. We'll call them play relatives that are Jewish, but you guys are all 100% Gentile. Jesus and Beelzebul, or Beelzebub, 
the Lord of the Flies. Then they brought to him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, so he couldn't see and he couldn't speak. Jesus healed him so that he could speak and see. All the crowds were amazed and said, could this one be the son of David? <laughs> Duh, do you think? And we saw in the genealogy, in the very beginning of the chapter, he's the son of David. He's the son, he's the son of, of Abraham and the son of David. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, he does not cast out demons except by the power of Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. So he's saying he's casting out demons in Satan's name. Now when Jesus realized what they were thinking, and remember, Jesus doesn't have to hear what these dudes are saying about him. It's like, oh, I know what you're thinking. He's doing the Vulcan mind melt on them. He said to them, every kingdom, kingdom divided against itself is destroyed. And no town or house divided against himself will stand. So if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? And this is true. He was, uh, he cast out demons, but there were there were Pharisees that cast out demons back then. So, you know, to take Satan for me to cast these demons out, like you're doing it, your people are doing it. Who are they doing it? And, and whose authority are they doing it? For this reason, they will be your judges. So he said, your sons, like your people. And so those people, those sons, they'll be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has already overtaken you. How else can someone enter a strong man's house and steal his property unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can thoroughly plunder the house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. <laughs> for this reason, I tell you, people will be forgiven for every sin and blasphemy but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. <clears throat> I'm not going to try to spin this. I've never understood exa exactly what this says, but the Bible is one of these things that you never stop studying. I've read a ton of scholarship of what different people with varied opinions believe this means. All I'm saying to you, don't worry about it. I know people are like, I think I blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Like, I'm condemned to eternal hell. Like, chill. Chill. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. Look, it's deep. We don't have to, I could go on for hours about this set of lines here. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you ask him to be your Lord and Savior? Do you ask him to forgive your sins? I don't believe that he's going to let you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit.
So now let's talk about trees and their fruit. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good, or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Offspring of vipers. So he's, he's talking to the Pharisees, and he's, and he's calling them the, the children of snakes. And who was the snake in the garden? Satan. So this started off with them going like, hey man, like you're casting out demons, but we think you're casting out demons by Satan. So now he's like, you sons of Satan, listen up. How are you able to say anything good since you are evil? So he's talking about the fruit of the tree. Like, are you a good tree or a bad tree? Because if you're a bad tree, your fruit's bad. And what my pastor at my original church, Calvary Chapel in Philadelphia, Pastor Joe Faust, would always say is, the Bible tells you to be a fruit inspector. Like, you're not supposed to judge other people, but you're supposed to be a fruit inspector. Like, you're supposed to look and go, well, let me judge these people by their fruits. And by judge, I'm not saying that you're condemning them to anything. You're not judging them that way. But you're going, first off, should I believe that person and what they say? Should I follow that person in any way, shape, or form? You know, or, you know, whatever it is. Or maybe even should I confront that person and say, like, hey, that's bad fruit. You're a bad tree right now. You need to clean that up. Offspring of vipers, how are you able to say anything good since you are evil? How can you have good fruit if, if, you have a bad, if you're a bad tree? For the mouth speaks from what fills the heart. The good person brings good things out of his good treasury. And the evil person brings evil things out of his evil treasury. I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every worthless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your, your words, you will be condemned. So Jesus is saying there's going to be a judgment day. And you can believe this or not believe it. That's not up to me. You have to make this decision. You can believe it, or you can just go, yeah, uh, this, Grandpa, this is a fairy tale. I'm just reading it to you. I believe it. So you have to ask yourself, are you a good tree right now or a bad tree? Someday, the ultimate fruit inspector, the God of the universe, is going to say, show me your fruit. Everything. <clears throat> You're going to be justified by your words. And, and the words come from the heart. Is your heart good or is your heart bad? So then let's, let's look at the sign of Jonah now. Then some of the experts in the law, so these are legal scholars, these are the scribes, along with some Pharisees answered him. So he's giving them this thing, but so they're doing a Jesus thing. They're, they're like, Question with a question. And answered them, they said, Teacher, we want to see a sign. <laughs> Less couple chapters, less few chapters, non stop signs. This man just went across the countryside healing everybody who came up and asked to be healed. 
everybody. And they say, we want to see a sign from you. So what they're doing is they're saying, we're the religious experts. And we've heard all this stuff about you. Do something for me right now. Prove to me who you are. But, but's a really important word. But in the middle of, the se of a sentence means <clears throat> this is going to change. If you hear, oh, you've done really, really good. Like your boss calls you into the office and says, you know, you've done really, really good. And you're going to go, yeah, he's about to say, but. And then he goes, but. I had a phone call from somebody, and it said that you call him a nasty name. <clears throat> so it, it changes everything. But, he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign the prophet Jonah. So what he's saying is, I gave signs. People asked to be healed, and I healed them. That's a sign. They had to figure out, well, who is this dude if he can heal people? But I'm not going to give you a sign. You think that you're the law. You're acting in, in the place of God, and I'm God. So I'm not giving you any sign except for this sign. The sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was in the belly of the huge fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And they're probably going... This guy's a lunatic. What is he talking about? But that's what's going to happen. He's going to be killed, put into a small cave, into a crypt, a burial crypt, which is, is a small cave in that part of the world. And three days later, he's going to come out. He's going to be raised from the dead. The people of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented when Jonah preached to them. And I can't wait to get to the book of Jonah. It's a fascinating book. Jonah sent to Nineveh and the, the, the people of Nineveh, I forget if they were Assyrians or I, I think they were Assyrians. They were fierce warriors, and they just slaughtered their enemies, and they hated the Jews. They ran roughshod over the Jews whenever they, they went into battle against them. And Jonah's like, I don't want to go there to save these people. God sends them there. To, like, here, you need to bring my message to the people of Nineveh. I'm like, yeah, right. And he goes on a ship and, and departs. <laughs> like, no, I'm going to go as far away from Nineveh as possible. God causes a storm. <clears throat> the sailors so throw Jonah overboard, and he winds up in the belly of a huge fish for three days and three nights. Then he spit up onto the, the sand and figures out, well, I better go there. And, and they know this story. So they're gone. It's not like, well, we don't know what this, who this Jonah guy is. They know the story of Jonah. And, and he's saying, I'm going to give you a sign. The Jonah story. That's my sign. I'm going to be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. They, they're clueless what he's talking about. And, um, and now, something greater than Jonah is here. 
the queen of, of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And now something greater than Solomon is here. So Solomon was the, the king of Judah after David. David ruled the whole nation of Israel. And then they split. When we're actually, Solomon may have ruled the whole nation for a little bit, but they, they split around that time. There was a northern, the 10 tribes, and then Judah and, and uh, Benjamin in Judah. And the queen, queen of Sheba came up because she had heard, and she's in North Africa, someplace maybe near Sudan, Ethiopia, some area there. She came all the way with all these gifts and everything. She was like the wealthiest woman in the known world. And she came because of the wisdom of, of, of Solomon. So it's like he's saying, you get Jonah, the preacher who comes and tells you to repent. or the wisdom, so you don't, you don't find God through wisdom. You find it through repenting. But you, you find godliness through wisdom. So you get both that. You get Jonah and you get Solomon. And these people who weren't from the children of Israel, and you think because you're in the children of Israel there, Pharisees and scribes, you think that you're getting into the kingdom of heaven. But these people, they'll be there. But you won't even make it to the coat check. You'll be thrown out on the street. When an unclean spirit goes out of a person, it passes through waterless places looking for rest, but does not find it. So we're talking about a demon. So it, it, it leaves a person. It, it needs like somebody, these spirits, they need to attach to somebody and, and mess up their lives. But it's, it's like going through a desert, like wandering but does not find it. Then it says, so it can't find some place to go, to leech on. Then it says, I will return to the home I left. When it returns, it finds the house empty, swept clean and put in order. And remember those dudes, the, uh, or the, the, the guy? In another story, it's two guys. But in this story, it's one guy at the crypts. And, and he's a demoniac. He goes crazy. He attacks people. And Jesus casts out the demons. And he's, and he's there and he's in his right mind, sitting there peacefully. And it's like they return and, and this guy's out of there. And then it goes and, and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself and they go in and live there. So the last state of that person is worse than the first. It will be that way for this evil generation as well. So he's saying like, you're like these horrible demonic spirits and you're not gonna fare well. You're asking me for a sign and notice he doesn't heal them. He hasn't even offered to heal them. Heal them. They could be. They could go, oh, yeah, we're really messed up. Jesus, make us whole. But they don't. 
because they know everything. They're in charge. They're the ones in power. While Jesus was still speaking to the crowds, his mother and brothers came and stood outside asking to speak to him. Someone told him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. To the one who had said this, Jesus replied, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And pointing toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So he's saying, these people mean a lot to me. And I'm going to go talk to them. But these people over here, they're my spiritual family. And that's greater than my physical family. So next time, we're going to get into chapter 13. Until then, peace out.